you are about to witness the very exciting story that will open new sights in familiar surroundings. The Atomic Age was born. It is a story of a city seeking new horizons in a resolute contest with great challenges. Welcome to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. Are you aware that water affects not just drinking water, but every aspect of every day of your life? This Green Time, we're going to talk about water, energy, and mining. But before we have the discussion, let's take a look at a few minutes of a great DVD, The Hidden Destruction of the Appalachian Mountains. Instead of digging underground to get to the coal seams, Coal companies now blast away as much as 600 feet of the mountaintop to reach the coal seams. Giant earth-moving machines, like the 200-foot-tall dragline shown in the center of the slide, move a hundred tons of coal in one scoop and do the work of a hundred men. The top of the mountain, which the coal industry calls overburden, is dumped into the river valleys between the mountains. This is called a valley fill. These enormous fills can be as much as one mile across. The red dot just to the right of this valley fill is a pickup truck. Over 1,000 miles of Appalachian mountain streams have been buried beneath valley fills in the past 20 years. Eww. Headwater mountain streams once gave life to millions of tiny aquatic organisms. These organisms, known as leaf shredders, are the bottom of the food chain for downstream fish like the plankton in the ocean. Erosion from the valley fills adds sediment to the clear mountain streams and fills old swimming and fishing holes up with gravel. Miles of trout streams have been ruined by runoff from the mountaintop removal. Free-flowing, shaded headwater mountain streams have been turned into dry, coal mining ditches. And black water spills from mountaintop removal mines contaminate streams with black mining sediments and heavy metals. This stream has been contaminated by acid mine drainage. Costs for environmental impacts are externalized from the coal mining company to downstream communities that have to purify the polluted drinking water. To taxpayers who have to fix the roads and bridges damaged by dangerously overloaded coal trucks. And to neighbors whose foundations have been cracked by blasting at the mine. Coal from the mountaintop removal mines is processed on the mountain by washing to remove the dirt. The residue from washing is stored behind the earthen dams. There are 653 coal slurry sludge ponds in the mountains of Appalachia. Many are 30 to 50 acres in size, a hundred feet deep, and contain billions of gallons of black sludge. In October of 2000, a 2.2 billion gallon coal slurry pond in Martin County, Kentucky, operated by the Massey Energy Corporation, accidentally released 300 million gallons of black sludge into two mountain streams, Coldwater Creek and Wolf Creek. The spill was over 20 times the size of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Fish, turtles, and other stream life were buried under 8 feet of sludge. Drinking water supplies were contaminated 80 miles downriver. The EPA called the spill the worst environmental disaster ever in the southeastern United States. The coal company called it an act of God. What you just saw was the hidden, a few minutes from the hidden destruction of the Appalachian Mountains. That DVD really shows a lot of the use of water, which is typical for the extractive industries. Extractive generally means mining or extracting things from the earth. 
With me, I have a really knowledgeable guest, Bob Chris. Uh, Bob, you teach um, at uh, Washington University at the mm -hmm. Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Is it, uh, do I have that correct? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you've studied a lot of things like coal and gas and shale and uranium. This is the, the sorts of things that you focus on. Mm -hmm. And tell me, how do, how do all of these various industries affect water? Well, almost everything human beings do affects water because we use so much of it. Uh, mining, milling, manufacturing, growing food, making energy, all these activities use tremendous quantities of water. Well, g give me an example of, of the, like how much energy do, do humans use from in, in terms of oil and uh, coal and uh, gas? Far more than most people realize, uh, every human being, every American, uh, uses some 23 barrels of, of oil a day, a barrel is 42 gallons. Uh, 42 gallons of oil per day? F f 42 gallons per barrel. Okay. We use 23 barrels 20, a year. 23, 23 barrels. So that's, that's several tons of petroleum. We mm -hmm. use several tons of coal every year and a ton and a half of natural gas every year. And Altogether, about nine tons of fossil fuel. Nine tons of fossil fuel per person per year. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not necessarily for heating your home or for um, just a, you, when you said we use that much gas, that's not necessarily for cooking. How, how else Most of it's for transportation. Okay. But uh, this also includes your own share of uh, the industrial and activities of, of our country. And so, so, if we took, so if we took all the roads in the world, and I mean all the roads in the United States and divided it by 330, uh, right. th then we might get to that. Okay, uh, what, are the, what are the effects of water? How's water contaminated by the extraction industries? Well, there, whether again, whether we're mining or uh, uh, growing food or whatever it is we do, we, we use tremendous quantities of water at every step. Mm -hmm. it, uh, and not only are we using large quantities of water, it, it takes like a, a half a ton of, uh, of uh, water just to grow a, enough wheat to make a loaf of bread. So, so the water in, in uh, agriculture is very high. Now, now tell me, what about, there, there's, whenever we're doing these extractive industries, are there new unwelcome sources of water? I mean, new un unwelcome bodies of water. Like in the DVD, it talked about the slurry ponds. Could you uh, tell us again what a, what a slurry pond is? Well, the water is used to clean metals. A slurry pond is, is used to uh, is gather the residue from washing ore or uh, uh, just extracting ore from, from or, the gang rock. Or, or if we were to have mined, uh, if we were to do lead mining, there might be tailings from the mine and that would, the water that was used to wash, they, 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 mm -hmm. that would be put someplace and that would be a tailing. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, would, um, that, that would be uh, very contaminated. Now what about, one of the things the movie talked about that we really don't think about very much with water is that it changes the absorption. How do extractive industries change the ground's absorption of water? We just change the surface of the earth, when, especially with surface mining mm -hmm. processes. They're on such a scale, strip mining, but any other surface mining or quarrying, open pit mining, all change the topography of the land. They mess up the water table and, so it's and hard remove the vegetation, the soils. So the the whole watershed has changed dramatically. And so we're a lot more open to flooding because then the water cannot be absorbed into the ground as easily. Right, it causes those sort of changes. It, it uh, brings water into contact with unwanted chemicals and, and uh, uh, sulfide ores and other things that contaminate the water. So there's, there's effects on both the quantity and the quality of water. Okay, let's, let's take a look at another uh, just a couple of minutes from another DVD called Yellow Cake, which is about how water is affected by uranium and nuclear power. It's the mine, the mill where we are, the conversion facility and the enrichment facility. There is contamination, water, air and soil at every phase. It takes thousands and thousands of gallons of water 
simply to explore for uranium. It's also going to contaminate the water that is here that does get into the system. And a water table can be contaminated by one test hole. But when you get to the point where you're actually excavating it, where you get to the point where you're milling it, that takes millions of gallons of water. There are 104 reactors in the country. 24 of them are in trouble because of drought. When they come in and do an open pit strip mine, it's going to take the water out of the system. Paducah's enrichment facility in Kentucky uses 26 million gallons of water a day. It is a filthy industry both coming out of the ground and going back into the ground. 99.9% .9 of what they put out their door is uranium milling waste and a very small amount of uh, the volume of materials that come through is actually produced out the other end as yellow cake. I think we've got to do a better job in figuring out how we're going to deal with the waste. Uranium's half-life is going to be about a thousand generations. There's no way that we can protect that far into the future. You try to do the net present value on a thousand years worth of waste maintenance, which is the minimum required by law, but should be at least 10,000. Not only was there surface contamination because the ponds of old were flooded and washed into Lincoln Park, but there's groundwater contamination that is still a very persistent problem and probably will never go away. We just can't have this this close to people. Welcome back to Green Time. We just saw a segment of Yellow Cake, which is about uranium mining and nuclear power. With me, I have Bob Chris mm -hmm. from Washington University. Now, Bob, one of the things that I liked about Yellow Cake is it showed the whole process of for nuclear power. That it's not just the power plant itself, but you have to go through mining, milling, disposal of waste, and, and, and including disposal of waste water. Uh, are there other industries that you could give me an example of where there's, there's a whole process and not just one step? Well, coal mining and fossil fuels all are very hard on the, the water supply. Mm -hmm. uh, same as uranium processing. It, it, uranium isn't necessarily green energy because with all these other steps uh, taken into consideration, there's tremendous water use and tremendous environmental impacts all along the way. With uh, surface mining for coal, mm. uh, again, you uh, disturb vast acreages of land to mine the stuff. You, mm. you disturb the water table. You contaminate water supplies. You use lots of water in coal washing, in processing the coal. And, of course, that coal washing is what leads to slurry ponds. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really not positive. Now, I tell you, one of the things that is done with industrial processes that we usually don't think about affecting waters that changes the water temperature. Uh, and they, they, um, they mentioned that a little bit in uh, Yellow Cake. Could you, mm -hmm. and what, what happens with a power plant near St. Louis, like the Labity power plant? What happens there to water temperature? Well, most power plants, including nuclear plants, use steam-driven turbines mm -hmm. to actually generate the, the electricity. And of course, the, the heating is provided either by burning fossil fuel or by a nuclear reactor. But then the apparatus has to be cooled off, the, the circulating fluids, mm -hmm. and that part of the, the circulation system that involves the steam and the turbine have to be condensed. This takes tremendous amounts of water. I think at the Labity plant, they pump upwards of a million gallons a minute. Oh, that's incredible. And now, they and take it out of the Missouri River and they return that water oh, back does, hot. Is, oh, is, is it returned? It's returned hotter than when they Much took it. Much hotter. So what does that do to aquatic life and to the, the quality of the river when, it's, when hot water is returned back, into, back to it? Well, hot water promotes algal growth. Some, some fish species aren't tolerant of uh, a lot of temperature variations and stuff, but warm water is, is not a positive. We so, want clear, cool, clean water. Okay, so that, that actually could make more algae grow and it could interfere with the whole, with the aquatic life, which, mm -hmm. is, which is there. Okay, uh, let's take a look at our, the third DVD that we're just a, cu a couple of minute clips that we're going to look at uh, today, um, which is unleaded to talk, uh, that shows us some, some of the things that happen when you're doing lead mining and lead smeltering. Does lead also have an effect on the environment? 
To answer this question, I talked to Tom Cruzen from the Sierra Club. To answer my questions about lead, he first took me on what he liked to call the toxic tour. This tour started in some of the most beautiful places in Missouri. Greer Spring, which uh, is the second largest spring in, in Missouri, uh, certainly the, the most wild spring and least developed. It's just one of the, I would say, some of the best that wild Missouri has to offer. And, and it's in direct contrast to what uh, was proposed here uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, when the Doe Run Company wanted to uh, mine for lead and other minerals in this area. What, what we have here is this incredible water. You're looking through three to five feet of beautiful crystal clear water coming out of Round Spring. Because of, we, of all the, the tree cover and the ground cover that we have in the Ozarks, and the lack of industry, the lack of heavy industry, we have incredibly clean water. And uh, some of this water tests out to be uh, drinking water quality or very close to it. My tour then took me to sites in which Doe Run had successfully taken over. And that's the Tailings Pond. What's in that lake? 94% uh, of it is limestone. But you notice I said 94%. So six and even up to 10% of, of what goes in that pond is heavy metals. Straight across, you're going to see a little stream coming into the mainstream. That is their effluent from the mine. Well, there's a lot of contamination on a mine floor. There's ammonium nitrate, there's, there's all kinds of uh, uh, oil and, and diesel and you name it, nasty stuff. They pump all this out. I mean, this is their success. This is a tailings pond. And see, what's going to happen is this is going to be the way it is forever because nothing's going to grow in there. The water level goes up and down too much. Um, it's toxic. The 11 point wild and scenic river, I want to look like this? I don't think so. <laughs> Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. We just saw a couple of minutes from the film Unleaded about lead mining. And with me, I have Bob Chris from Washington University. Okay, Bob, when we talk about the effect of using water, what we've talked about mostly, especially the first part of the show, is fossil fuels. And we've also talked about a little bit about metals. Now, uranium is unique, isn't it? Because uranium is the only metal which is mined but used basically as a fuel. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it uh, very unusual. But what about some of the things that used to be done with gold mining? Oh um, my, some of the early extractive technologies used incredible amounts of water. It brings to mind hydraulic mining. And what, what was hydro? Well, it was a water cannon, wasn't it? They used huge water cannons. Their nozzle openings were as big as 10 inches. The, mm. the brass nozzle itself might have been 15 feet long. They had hundreds of feet of water pressure. And they'd shoot those things as, as far as several hundred yards and wash away whole huge hillsides and slopes. And, and so in a slide that we have that shows a, a nice uh, hillside, hillside and a valley, that valley in, in the side. That was not, made by the water it's, it's not. It's not natural. And did, did you tell me that that was the first law that was uh, the, the environmental regulation? There was so much debris from these hydraulic mines in the 1800s, mm -hmm. just a few decades after the gold rush in California, that they had hundreds of feet of gravel in almost every creek in the foothills along the Sierra. And they were raising the it's causing a lot of flooding down in the Central Valley of California. But so, how, how would you compare that to what's being done in the uh, extraction of uh, coal from mountaintop removal today? Do you the arguments are oddly similar. The, the hydraulic miners were arguing as soon as the gravel and waste are off their property, it's not any of their concern. Even as I was a kid growing up in eastern Kentucky, uh, every time you had a big landslide from, from coal, tailings, and 
it was always an act of God. <laughs> and we, we even hear this, this kind of argument uh, today. And, but but the, is it fair to say that the sorts of things that are being done in mountaintop removal are as devastating today as the other, uh, as the water cannons were a hundred years ago? They're far more devastating just because of their scale. They're even okay. far greater okay. acreage is being disturbed. Now what about quarries for uh, things like limestone and sand and uh, let's see, I, I think we have a slide of a gravel pit that used to be a creek. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that show us? About well the creek runs right through it. We have many gravel operations in the United States including mm -hmm. St. Louis County that mm -hmm. uh, are right, right in stream beds mm -hmm. or right adjacent to stream beds because that's where the gravels are and uh, you do stir up a lot of mud. And, 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 and so the, it doesn't, when you get through extracting gravel, it doesn't look like, the stream doesn't look like it did before. Well, it's very disturbed and of course that mm -hmm. those impacts move downstream. Okay, and w one of the things uh, issued also that we don't think about very much is food. Uh, what, what's the connection between pesticides and, and, and food? And how, how do pesticides affect w our water supply? The pesticides affect our food that we buy at the grocery store if they're residual quantities, but they also get into the water. Pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, the fine example is these blooms of algae and stuff in the mm -hmm. Gulf uh, Coast. Mm -hmm. That uh, is because of the nitrate fertilization of Midwestern farms. It's, Making all these and, and sometimes they put the water, they put the pesticides right into the water. Yeah, out west they flood irrigate with groundwater and they add chemicals directly to the water mm -hmm. and then spread the water around. It's not sprayed by airplanes, they, they put the chemicals directly in the water. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's no surprise that later on that water, whether it runs off the land or infiltrates and, and gets back to the water table, it has all these chemicals in it. Yeah. And of course there's water used in the manufacture, like automobiles, I think there's 350,000 liters that are used just to manufacture one car. Um, now what, water is generally, we think of fresh water as aquifers, and then, which is underground water, mm -hmm. and then um, water from lakes, streams, and rivers. Is this being used up in the, in the world? Well, the, the surface waters are allegedly renewable. Mm -hmm. the rivers keep flowing. One thing I would point out though is the quality of that water is not necessarily renewable and aquifers are definitely not renewable. At least not cases. in our lifetimes. They may take hundreds or thousands well, of years to renew an aquifer. Millions of years. It depends on the aquifer. And so once the water is pumped, pumped out of the ground, we don't get it back in, in 20 or 30 years. Yes, and it, it is surprising to people but almost half the people in the United States use groundwater. Mm -hmm. We even have uh, St. Charles County has got all kinds of big well fields. Columbia, Missouri, Independence, Missouri, they mostly are okay. use they, groundwater. Now I want to ask you the most difficult question of this show and, and that is we talk about, you know environmentalists usually talk about having more environmental regulations but there's only so much that you can regulate. It sounds to me like water is a really devastating issue. Now, how much can we really do if we had perfect regulation and perfect unions could demand that none of their members be poisoned, communities could demand that none of their water be polluted? Could that get rid of all the problem or is, or is there some part of it which is inherent to industry no matter how good it control High that. water use is inherent to growing food. We can do better with, uh, mm -hmm. rather than flood irrigating, we can, can use uh, uh, little uh, drip irrigation systems and other ways that it would save a lot of water. But uh, can, our can, biggest can, problem mm -hmm. is that water is not properly priced. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Is, do you think it would be, if, if we had the best regulations, could we, do you think we could be closer to solving 10% of the problem or 90% or do you Pro think? Probably 10%, but uh, it's just a guess. Okay, but, but, but I, I uh, think the proper pricing of water that, would, and that would, we might, would we actually do, we, correct we, the problem. We might actually do a whole show on that. Uh, but I, what we're saying is that the, the whole issue of water is so enormous that really we have to stop using so much extraction industries if, if we're going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for coming in. This is, we've crammed a lot of information in, into the, uh, a, a very short period of time. 
I want to thank everybody uh, for tuning in to this episode of Green Time and uh, listening to our discussion of water, and we hope that you tune in next week to Green Time.